Hi, I'm Jason Lau, and Bobby Evans and I are here to talk to you today about GPU support in Apache Spark 3. So today we're going to cover GPU features that have been added to Apache Spark 3. We're going to talk about a plugin that we've added to accelerate SQL and data frame operations, and also how we've been able to accelerate shuffle when doing GPU operations for ETL. And finally, we're going to conclude with what's next, next steps. So first, let's talk about the GPU features in Apache Spark 3. So first off, let's talk about uh, the accelerated aware scheduling, which means GPUs are now a schedulable resource in Apache Spark. This is covered by Spark 24615, that Apache Jira. And this allows users to request resources at the executor level, the driver level, and the task level. And it'll also allows those resources to be discovered on the nodes and to determine what resources were assigned to tasks and to the driver. And this feature is supported on Yarn, Kubernetes, and standalone mode clusters. So here's an example, a command line example showing Spark shell being run against a Yarn cluster. And we can see that these configs here, where we set Spark driver resource GPU amount to one, that says we want the driver to have one GPU. And we can also set a discovery script, a shell script to be used to discover the GPUs on the driver node. And then we can also set Spark executor resource GPU amount to two, meaning we want each executor to request two GPUs. And correspondingly, we can specify a GPU discovery script for the executors. And then finally, we can also specify the task resource GPU amount, meaning we want every task to use one GPU. So with this configuration in particular, we are expecting no more than two tasks to run at one time on an executor because each task is going to use one GPU and each executor will have at most two GPUs. So speaking of that discovery script example, here, here is a discovery script where we're going to use a shell script to detect what accelerated resources we have on a node. And that script just needs to take and produce JSON formatted strings that are going to be parsed by Spark to determine the accelerators that have been discovered on a node. So this particular example uses the NVIDIA SME binary, which is installed with the NVIDIA driver. And that, can, and that produces output that is then marshaled uh, into a form that Spark can use to detect the GPUs on that system. So. Once the GPUs have been detected and Spark has scheduled them, it's very convenient to be able to determine what has been assigned. So for example, let's say in that example, we're asking for two GPUs and each task is using a GPU, it might be useful to find out which GPU a task was assigned. So there's an API for that. Tasks can get the task context and within there, there's a resources map that they can use to look up by accelerator type, in this case, GPUs, to find the addresses that were assigned. And those addresses are strings and can be passed into TensorFlow or other AI code to, to determine what indices or addresses were assigned for a particular GPU. And similarly on the driver, you can get that from the Spark context. There's the resources map looking up by accelerator type GPU in this case. And this example shows that the driver was assigned GPU zero. So this accelerator where scheduling has also been hooked into the Spark UI. So if you click on the executors tab in the UI and then enable the resources additional metric checkbox, that opens up this resources column where we can see what GPUs have been assigned to the driver and executors. So you can actually verify that you are asking for GPUs and which GPUs you've actually been assigned for your Spark application. So another feature is stage level scheduling. And this solves the problem where a lot of Spark applications are built with an ETL stage, and then they feed that into a machine learning stage. So we're cleaning and prepping data, and then we're gonna do some machine learning on that data. And traditionally, that is run with CPUs in the ETL stage and GPUs for the ML stage, right, the training. And the problem with that today is, is that the ETL stage is not using GPUs, and the machine learning stage is. And if we try to run that in a single application, the ETL may run for quite a long time. And if we need to use GPUs, we need to ask for those GPUs for every task. And that means during the ETL stage, we'll be sitting and scheduled on GPU nodes, but not using those GPUs. And that leads to poor GPU utilization 
and angry users that are trying to use those GPU nodes when they're not being used by other users during their ETL stage. So stage level scheduling is designed to solve that problem. This is covered by Spark 27.495, that JIRA. And this allows users to specify resource requirements per RDD operation. This means Spark can dynamically allocate containers to meet the resource requirements at particular stages. So you don't have to have a uniform task requirement for the whole application. And then this is coming soon in Spark 3.1. It just missed the Spark 3.0 cutoff, but the, the feature is almost complete and that will be ready in Spark 3.1. So finally, I would like to talk about SQL columnar processing. This is in Spark 3.0. It's covered by the JIRA Spark 27396. And this extends Catalyst, Catalyst being uh, Spark's SQL engine. There's a plugin interface to Catalyst, and this extends that plugin interface to allow columnar processing by plugins. Plugins can modify the query plan with columnar operations. And that means that plans can ex plan nodes can exchange RDD of columnar batch instead of RDD of row. And this columnar format enables efficient processing by vectorized accelerators, such as SIMD units, FPGAs, and GPUs. So with all these features put together, Project Hydrogen Initiative is coming to fruition, right? We have Spark 2, where, as I mentioned before, traditionally in the pipeline of relating to machine learning, we've got data preparation done on a CPU cluster orchestrated by Spark, that necessarily is getting serialized out to a shared storage. And then a separate cluster for GPUs that actually loads that serialized data back up and trains it with XGBoost, TensorFlow, your, you know, your favorite AI framework. With Spark 3, we have finally a unified architecture. We have a single pipeline. With stage level scheduling, we can actually schedule it all as one application. We can do ingestion, prep, model training, all orchestrated by Spark single platform built for AI. And this infrastructure is consolidated and simplified. And critically, we now can accelerate the ETL portion with GPUs using that plugin API. And speaking of plugin APIs, I'd like to hand it off to my colleague, Bobby Evans, to cover how we built a plugin to accelerate SQL and data frame operations. Thanks, Jason. Um, so yes, as Jason said, I'm going to be talking about uh, the plugin that we wrote to be able to do accelerated uh, data frame and SQL processing on the GPU. Uh, so the big question in everybody's mind is, ET can we make ETL fast with the GPU? Uh, it, it seems pretty obvious that the two would go well together, but why hasn't anybody done it yet? And we'll get into some of the details about that. But let's start off with an example. Uh, so. Here are some numbers that we ran on some TPCXBB queries. Uh, these queries were run on two DGX2 nodes, and uh, we devoted all 96 cores of each of those GPU nodes to, uh, to doing the processing on the CPU side. Uh, there's a whole lot of host memory. They weren't bound by host memory. There's a lot of uh, NVMEs on these nodes as well. So, we were giving them as much processing power as possible. But as you can see, we still were able to achieve some really amazing performance speed up by, uh, by doing this. The next uh, use case that we wanna talk a little bit about is also a, a kind of standard use case that people have. It's the deep learning recommendation machines, DLRM from Facebook. Uh, so the DL, DLRM scripts come uh, pre-built with uh, being able to do the Credio data set. That's a one terabyte, seven day click stream, anonymized data set to be able to do some recommendation, uh, to build a recommendation model with. The really hard part of this is the cardinality of the data. The DLRM wants to be able to do, uh, it, they, they want to be able to have everything in terms of numbers rather than being able to, to process strings directly. And so we need to be able to do something similar to, to, to Spark's uh, string, string remapping, but the, the cardinality is so high that it's something Spark's default implementation just can't handle. DLRM comes with a single script, a Python script to do this, but it's really quite horrible because it's single threaded. And 
it, it's a really fabulous script. There's a lot of work that has gone into it, but it takes forever, as you can see in this next slide. That doing the ETL with that default script took about six days. Uh, we had one person run it, but they didn't actually record the time. Uh, they were just rec running it for uh, verification that we were producing correct results and they forgot to record the time and I couldn't convince anybody to run it again, but it took about six days to run that script end to end. Uh, so we wrote a, a Spark script to be able to do the same sort of processing. And on 96 cores, that, that Spark script was able to reduce it from six days, 144 hours down to about 12 hours, which is still a rather long time. Uh, and the training side, Training on that same 96 core CPU took about 45 hours to do the training. So this is a fairly typical use case where you're doing ETL and then you're doing training. And as you can see, the GPU training took about 0.7 hours, a little less than three quarters of an hour on a single V100 GPU. So you can see the typical state of the art that people are doing is going to be taking a Spark ETL job and running it on very wide and then going to do training on a GPU. That, that's kind of the state of the art today. But we wanted to see if we could make things even better. And so we took the plugin that we've been working on and we threw it at this, uh, this ETL processing. And a single V100 brought that processing time from 12 hours down to two, 2.3 hours, which is a huge speed up, it's really great. But we wanted to see if we could go even further and scale out as well, because two hours, you're still going to be only able to do a couple iterations a day. Uh, it's not really a full, it's not really go grab a cup of coffee, go grab a lunch break, come back and your processing is done. So we also tried throwing eight V100s at the same job and we were able to get the processing time down to about half an hour. So you can see here, you know, head to head, how, how these different things stack up from the, the crazy CPU only version, which is single threaded to the Spark CPU, CPU only version. And then the state of the art of what people are typically seeing and doing today, which is still over 12 hours of processing all the way down to the GPU enabled version, which can be done in a little over an hour. Uh, with this, we're able to speed up from the, the, the state of the art several X uh, over what, what's already there. And we can also uh, speed up, we can drop the, the, the cost drastically as well. So Jensen, our, our CEO, he, he has this quote, he loves to say, the more you buy, the more you save. And I think in this case, it's, it's really true. Um, so, with this, we are really starting to show what Project Hydrogen can do, that, that we're able to create a, a system, which is this plugin, the Rapids Accelerator for Apache Spark, where we can do all of the processing on the GPU end-to-end -end machine learning and ETL together. So let's get into some of the details of, of how this plugin works, how, how the SQL side of it works. So the first thing I want to emphasize is that there are no code changes at all. That the way that we, we built this, it should be a transparent drop-in replacement to what you're doing. There may be a few config changes to be able to tune things properly, but the code itself should remain completely unchanged. We don't support everything, but we do have a, a very large library of, of operators that we do support right now. And we're working on growing that every day. Is it a silver bullet? I mean, we're here talking about it. No, obviously it's not gonna solve all problems for all queries. Uh, small amounts of data. So if you look at the chart on the side here, that is a log based chart of fairly, of several different common typical IO speeds that you'll get, all the way from the CPU cache at about a terabyte a second down to a spinning disk at 160 megabytes a second. And for the GPU, 
we're typically operating on a separate PCIe slot. So we're either Gen 3 or Gen 4, which means to be able to get your data from main memory onto the GPU to do processing, we're going to go, we need to move that data at about 12 gigabytes, maybe 13 gigabytes a second. And that provides a fair amount of overhead to be able to, that we have to overcome on the GPU and doing processing to be able to pay for that. And so if you're processing relatively small amounts of data, less than a few hundred megabytes per partition, the GPU is going to have a hard time to overcome that. We typically see once you get above a couple hundred megabytes, the GPU really starts to pay for itself. Uh, other issues that we run into, cache coherent processing. It's not that the GPU is bad at it, it's just that the CPU is very good at it too. And so trying to overcome the CPU cache there at a terabyte a second becomes very difficult. Uh, the other thing is data movement. That if you're reading your data from spinning disks at 160 megabytes a second, you're probably IO bound to begin with. You're probably not compute bound. However, we see in a lot of cases, especially with SSDs, NVMEs, people are compute bound more or less the entire time that they're processing. That, that the, the IO has gotten to be good enough that the CPU can't quite keep up anymore. Uh, we also have, have issues with things like UDFs where if you're doing a lot of processing on things that we can't accelerate on the, on the, the GPU yet, then going back and forth between uh, the CPU and the GPU adds a lot more overhead to be able to pay for itself. And there are also a few situations where the limited amount of GPU memory we have uh, can cause some issues, but we'll get into those uh, more as we go on. But it can be truly amazing in a lot of cases. So if you have high cardinality data, if you're doing very big joins, very big aggregates, crazy sorts, the GPU can eat those up and just go at insane speeds compared to what the CPU can do. If, your win if the window that you're operating on is bigger than the, the CPU cache for say a sort or a join, you're definitely going to be able to beat it on the GPU. Window operations. A lot of window operations in Spark are N squared, where N is the size of the window that you have. And so if you're doing processing on large windows, the GPU can completely destroy the CPU in many cases. Uh, we found aggregations with lots of distinct operations. We're able to process those much, much faster than the CPU can. We've seen really weird corner cases where we're talking 100x speed up, which we, we had to do a double take and go back and check to be positive that we hadn't messed it up somehow. But we, we literally saw for one customer a 100x speed up on certain uh, distinct aggregate queries. So complicated processing is another thing that we do really, really well. And you may think, I, I, I don't have any complicated processing. Well, if you're writing out to Parquet or Orc, those are incredibly expensive processing. That they're doing all kinds of compression, they're doing lots of deduplication and other statistics and things to be able to get the size of those files as small as possible. And we can see, in some cases, 20x speed up by writing to Parquet or Orc than the, the CPU can. Uh, parsing CSV can also be very expensive. It's a, it's a very strange format to, to be doing on the, CP, on the GPU, but uh, a lot of really smart people have spent a bunch of time to figure out how to do that in a, a really parallel way. And we're able to, to beat the CPU in most cases with CSV parsing as well. So how does it work? How do we actually make all of this happen? Well, Inside Spark, there's the, the framework called Catalyst, as Jason talked about. And in Catalyst, you'll either take an input this SQL, where we'll go through a SQL parser and get turned into a data frame object. Or if you're using the data frame API directly, it will just, you'll just essentially be building up the same abstract syntax tree that the SQL was doing to produce uh, the data frame. And as soon as you say go, that's a collect or a write or anything that's going to stop the lazy evaluation and actually do processing. At that point, Catalyst starts to do a bunch of compiling and optimizations. So it will take the data frame, turn it into a logical plan, 
That logical plan will get several optimizations. It will get turned into a physical plan. The physical plan will also go through several optimizations. And then it will finally get turned into an RDD of internal row. So the actual processing that Catalyst is doing is all done in RDDs, just like just, just as any other Spark processing is done. But the, the stages above it are being compiled down to produce an optimized RDD. And so what you see on the UI uh, in Spark is a representation of that physical plan. And so for the plugin, what we do is we tie into that. So all of the stages above the physical plan are the same. So the same optimizations, everything that, that happens. And then near one of the very last stages in the physical plan operations, right before code generation and a few things like that, we get a chance to take a look at the physical plan. And we can walk through the physical plan and do a one-to-one -one mapping more or less from operators that are CPU enabled on in Spark Catalyst to operators in a physical plan that can run on the GPU. And those GPU enabled columnar operators are operating on RDDs of columnar batch, which then when we're done, we will convert back to RDDs of internal row to be able to provide a, a, a clean, transparent transition between the, the GPU processing and the CPU processing. So as an example here, kind of a single simple query laid out, CPU on one side, GPU on the other. So in this query, we're doing a very, very simple hash aggregate. And so we'll read in a parquet file in both cases. Since parquet is a columnar format, the data is already columnar. So we don't have to do any kind of transition from rows. On the CPU side, however, the CPU, after it reads in the columnar data, it needs to convert it into rows to be able to do the rest of the processing. And so the next step that it does is it converts those columns into rows so it can start doing the first stage of the hash aggregate. We just, on the GPU side, we skip that and just go directly into a GPU enabled stage of hash aggregate. Then we start to do a shuffle. So we, in the CPU side, they're shuffling rows. On the GPU side, we put in optimizations to be able to shuffle columnar data efficiently. Uh, with that though, like I said, one of the optimizations that we really try to do is to process enough data to pay for it, the, the cost of moving that data. And so one of the optimization stages we put in right after the shuffle is to combine those shuffle data back together into larger chunks so that the GPU can be more efficient in processing. After that, both stages go into the second stage of uh, aggregate processing. And then finally, we go out and we write out the parquet file. Now, there's a little bit of oddness on the GPU plan. After we write out a parquet file, there's a conversion from rows, from columns to rows at the end. All stages inside a, a, a Spark plan have an output. The parquet file writer produces no output, but because of, of things we haven't fixed yet, we're still putting in a transition at the end to, tra to, to translate nothing that's columnar data into nothing that's rows. Uh, we have plans to remove that at some point in the future, but you may see it and as you, you go, don't get scared. It, it's not gonna impact performance in any way. So with that, we're able to build up an entire, we, we built up an entire stack the, to be able to do processing for this. So the underlying pieces that, that we're, we're using. Uh, so each stage in that, that plan, each of those GPU stages, we've implemented them in terms of uh, QDF processing. So QDF is an open source library based off of Rapids, which is an open source uh, set of libraries that use arrow formatted data in the GPU to be able to, to communicate with each other. All of these are built on top of CUDA. Uh, QDF itself provides a Python API that is very compatible with pandas. And if you're a panda shop and you do a lot of processing with that, I would encourage you to go check out QDF. But what we've done is we've also added in Java APIs on top of the same base library. And then we've implemented each of those operators in terms of 
that those Java APIs so that we can then get the this parallel accelerated processing in Spark. We're going to jump into a demo now, but before we do, I want to explain a little bit about the setup that we have. Uh, this setup is on Databricks in AWS, and we we just pulled up two uh, two clusters using the, the the latest version of Databricks for Spark 3.0. Uh, on the CPU side, it's uh, fairly standard. We got a, a R4x large for the driver and R4 R4 2x large nodes for the workers. On the GPU side, we have a, a P2x large for the driver. That's actually not needed. Uh, Databricks is still working through some things. The driver for us doesn't require a GPU at all, but Databricks, because of how the ML pieces are set up, if you set up a GPU cluster, you have to have a GPU node. So we threw one in there. Shouldn't make any difference to the total cost or anything. Uh, it is just a couple of cents difference. On the workers though, we're using the P3 2X large nodes. Uh, so it, it's more or less the same between the two nodes. It's just, we've added one V100 to each node to do processing. This demo is doing data preparation and feature engineering on the 200 gigabyte Fannie Mae single family loan performance data set in preparation for training an XGBoost model. The query itself is pretty standard uh, PySpark. There are two queries here, one for each cluster, the GPU cluster and the CPU cluster. They are identical, except for the location where we store the intermediate data so they don't collide, and a couple of configs to tune each query optimally, either for the CPU or the GPU. These queries take quite a long time to run, so we're going to get them started and then we can explain more information about the setup and everything else as they're running. We'll start the CPU first, give it a little bit of a head start and start the GPU notebook just right behind it. The GPU cluster is on the left, the CPU cluster is on the right. We already covered what's in it, so just to let you see for yourselves that we brought them up, that they're the same, 12 nodes on each. The only difference is that there's a V100 GPU on each of the nodes on the GPU cluster and uh, not on the CPU cluster. We're going to put the video in fast forward playback now. You can watch the timer on the right to see how things are going. There are two steps that we're going to do in the processing. The first step is to transcode the data from CSV into Parquet. The reason we're doing this is to reduce the total size of the data from 200 gigabytes of CSV into about 16 gigabytes of compressed Parquet data. The reason why we're doing this is to reduce the amount of data that we have to load as we process from S3. The, the data is originally stored in S3. We've just mounted it under the Databricks file system here. So, by compressing it, we reduce the total amount of access that we have to do to S3 and it speeds up the query. But the second thing that it does is it allows for predicate pushdown. Parquet is a columnar format. It stores the data for each column separately. And so in this complicated query where we do self joins several times, it can reduce the total workload, the, the total amount of data that we have to read by a significant factor because we only have to read the columns that we care about. And so that's why we're doing this first step of transcoding the data into Parquet. We're going to switch back to normal playback speed soon because the GPU cluster is just about done with all of the processing that it needs to do. Now that the GPU job has completed, let's go take a look at the Spark UI for the GPU cluster, just so that you can see what it looks like. That we have integrated in all the GPU changes pretty seamlessly, and it should be pretty intuitive that on the SQL page, you can see 
that we have the same type of boxes, the same type of events that you'd expect on a Databricks UI, same with uh, the normal Apache Spark UI. We even have integrated in all the metrics that you would expect on each of these boxes. So if I open that up, we'll scroll over and you can take a look. There are metrics there that are GPU specific as well. And now that we're done with the GPU cluster, let's shut it down and then we'll speed up the rest of the playback so that you don't have to wait around for 20 plus minutes for the CPU to finish. Even at 20x playback speed, it's going to be kind of slow to, <laughs> to wait for the CPU to finish. So to avoid you getting bored, let's jump straight into some of the results of this, this run. So the GPU ended up being about four times, a little over four times faster than the CPU, almost seven minutes exactly versus 29-ish minutes on the C CPU side. And the cost, well, V100s are kind of expensive, but we still ended up being about 25% cheaper if you're paying for Databricks Enterprise than the CPU version. I hope you've enjoyed this demo. Thanks for watching. As you can see, we, we've gotten some really great speed ups by being able to do this, that we got a, a 4X speed up in performance which is really quite amazing, and also an 18% cost savings. Now, the numbers you saw before in the video on the cost savings, those were for the Enterprise Edition. Standard Edition, we still win. We still get an 18% cost savings. But that's not very much, and we know that. And so we decided to try and run with a slightly different set of GPUs. So T4 GPUs are designed for inference. So they have a little bit less processing. They're a lot cheaper than a V100, which is really optimized for the training, the MLDL side. T4s fit better with SQL. And so to get an idea of what we wanted, uh, to get an idea of what the cost could be like, we spun up a cluster in AWS itself, not on, on, uh, not on Databricks, and set it up with 12, uh, 12 nodes with T4s. So same number of cores as before, actually less memory, but doing the same processing. And we ran the exact same notebook through. What we ended up being is that the V100 was able to do the processing a little bit faster. So instead of 4.1x, the T4s were 3.8x, but they're also much, much cheaper than the V100s. And we were able to see a 50% cost savings just on the AWS side uh, across the board. And that translates into what we would predict would happen also on Databricks. Databricks, from what we hear, is going to start supporting T4s in Q3 sometime. I don't know for sure. You're going to have to talk to them about it. But uh, these numbers, we, we just assumed, worst case, they charge as much as a V100 uh, as far as the Databricks units for, uh, for that as well. And even with that, we're able to see a 50% cost savings on this query just by, uh, by using the, the T4s. So we wanted to see, you know, is, is this just that one query? After all, uh, you know, that, that's a query we wrote. How can you trust it? It's, it's one of those weird benchmarks we wanted to see on other queries as well. So we took a couple TPC XBB queries and ran them on the exact same cluster and to show the CPU versus the GPU version. And here as well, we saw about a three and a half X speed up and a 40% cost savings on TPC on these two TPC XBB queries on that same, uh, same setup. So now I'm going to turn the time over to Jason to talk a bit more about the second part of the acceleration that we're doing, and that's accelerated shuffle. Thanks, Bobby. So let's talk about accelerated shuffle and what that means when we're processing on GPUs. So when we're talking about shuffle, let's make sure we're on the same page. When we say shuffle, we're referring to the data exchange between Spark stages. So here's an example showing 
two stages in a Spark job. The first stage has a parallelism of three, represented by the three tasks, zero, one, and two. And the second stage has a parallelism of two, so the two tasks there. And as stage one runs, every task there is going to partition its output into two partitions, re you know, reflecting the parallelism of the stage after it. So, the, and when that stage completes, we're going to transfer or shuffle all of those partitions to the respective tasks in the subsequent stage. So that transfer, that exchange is the shuffle. So let's think about what happens when we start processing ETL operations, SQL and data frame operations on a GPU and what happens during the traditional shuffle. So for this example, let's assume that GPU zero is where some data has been produced and is ready to be shuffled to the next stage. So here we can see that the Spark shuffle is what I would refer to as a CPU centric data movement, which makes sense because traditionally Spark has always executed on CPUs. So here, let's say we want to transfer the data. So as soon as the stage completes, the data is going to be fetched from GPU zero by the CPU into main host memory and then written out to disk just as Spark shuffle works today. And that's going to cross, cross the PCIe bus, as Bobby referred to earlier. We're going to cross that into the CPU, into the host memory, and we're going to cross it back down into local storage as we store that data. Then when the next stage runs, let's say on the same node, GPU1 runs another task in the next stage, and it wants to fetch that partition. So what's going to happen is the CPU is going to then fetch that data from local store. Maybe the page cache in the operating system avoids that read. Maybe it doesn't. Depends on how much activities happen on that node in the interim. Uh, and then it's going to send that data down to the GPU uh, across the PCIe bus again. And let's say what happens if it's running on a GPU on a different node. So then it's going to fetch that data. The CPU will fetch the data and write it across the PCIe bus to the network. And that network is that that NIC is going to send that data across the network to the remote node, who's then going to cross the PCIe bus to the CPU on that node and fetch back across the CPU the PCIe bus again to the GPU on the remote node. So you can see that we're crossing the PCIe bus, you know, somewhere between, you know, about four to six times, depending on whether we get page cache effects or not, uh, as we do this operations. So we we want to see if we can improve that. So can we do something more like a GPU centric data movement? So in the same scenario, same setup, GPU zero has produced the output, but we're going to see if we can do something better than always fetching it to host memory and always writing it to disk. So the first step we're going to do is we're going to cache that data on GPU zero where it was produced in the hopes that we can do something more, you know, something uh, smarter with it. So let's say the next stage has to run on GPU zero. If we get lucky, the next stage runs on GPU zero, goes to fetch this partition, it's already in GPU zero's memory. That's, that's the best kind of shuffle you could hope for because it's zero copy. We, you just fed the two right to each other. In the other scenario, let's say GPU one runs the next stage. If it's still cached in GPU zero's memory, well, often multiple GPUs in the same node are connected with a fabric called NVLink. And that is a high speed peer to peer network. That's not the PCIe bus, it's much faster than it. And we can do a direct transfer not involving the CPU between the two GPUs. And then that's also a very nice outcome. And let's say the remote case, again, as we talked about before, we need to send this to a GPU on remote node and it's still cached in the GPU zero's memory, then we may be able to leverage something called RDMA, a remote direct memory access, where the GPU, the data will be sent straight from GPU zero's memory to the NIC and across the network. And as it's received by the receiving end, it will go straight from that receiving NIC into the GPU memory of the receiving node, neither CPUs of either sender host or receiving host are involved in actually copying the data. And that's also very nice because it reduces the amount of PCIe bus traffic involved in the transfer and doesn't involve the CPU, meaning it's free to do other operations. And then of course, finally, you know, if we can't store all of it in the GPU zero's memory, GPU memory is, is you know, it, it is limited, then we need to spill somewhere. And in the future, we'd like to leverage a technology called GPU direct storage, where we could, again, similar to the network case, we could have the GPU's data directly transferred from the GPU to NVMEs or local storage banks on the node, rather than having it fetched into host memory and then fetch back across down to the local storage again. So speaking of spilling from GPU memory, let's see how it works today. 
uh, without GPU direct storage. So if we cannot hold all of the memory in GPU zero, then as GPU zero runs out of memory, we will on demand spill that, uh, those shuffle buffers, those partitions that need to be shuffled, we'll spill them to host memory across the PCIe bus. And then if we can't cache, we have a, a configurable amount of host memory that can be can, used as a cache there. And if we can't cache it there, then eventually we'll spill to local storage using the CPU as is done with Spark Shuffle today. So let's cover again the various scenarios of how we can transfer that data to the next stage. So again, if GPU one wants to fetch the data and it's in either on local storage or in host memory, if it's in local storage, we can fetch it from the CPU into host memory. And then from there, the GPU can fetch it from host memory down the PCIe bus, similar to how it works with legacy shuffle today. Uh, if we want to send it over the network, we may still be able to leverage RDMA in that case. Once it's in host memory, we can have the you know, RDMA directly transfer that data from host memory across the NIC to the remote. And again, importantly, on the receiving end, it won't enter host memory. It'll go straight from the NIC into the GPU, avoiding another you know, double crossing. And so we can still leverage some of those things, even in the case where we actually are spilling to host memory and then all the way to disk. So with all of these different transfers, you know, we are transferring between GPUs, uh, GPU memory to GPU memory, we're doing host memory to GPU memory, we're doing you know, GPU with RDMA, we may be doing GPU with TCP. There's all these different transports. How can we manage all those? And that's where UCX comes in. So UCX stands for Unified Communication X. It's an open source, open consortium that abstracts the communication transports. So you set up endpoints, and you tell UCX, I want to send from this endpoint to this endpoint, and it selects the best routes available. And it might select more than one route if you enable that feature for higher bandwidth. So for example, it supports TCP, supports RDMA, supports shared memory, and CUDA IPC for GPU transfers. And importantly, it supports zero copy GPU transfers over RDMA, as I'd mentioned before. It's important to note that RDMA does require network support, meaning you'll need something like InfiniBand or Rocky to do RDMA. And I highly recommend you visit uh, their website, uh, openucx.org, if you're interested in more information on that. So what happens if we put this together? We actually start running this shuffle plugin. So Again, this is a TPCX VB like query. It's similar to query 22, which is inventory pricing query. This is again running on those DGX2 nodes, the two DGX2 nodes, uh, 192 CPU cores total. And here, this shuffles about 225 gigabytes of compressed data. And running this on the CPU, the query executes in about 228 seconds, some 220 seconds, something like that. And if we just turn on the Rapids Accelerator plugin without a shuffle accelerator, just using Spark's legacy shuffle, that time cuts down to 45 seconds, which is a nice improvement. Uh, but can we do better? And so if we turn on this accelerated shuffle plugin, where we're trying to cache the data in GP memory, trying to leverage NV Link, trying to leverage RDMA, because these nodes are connected with InfiniBand, then we see that that time cuts from 45 uh, seconds down to just over eight seconds, which is a very, very nice win on an already nice win, right? So that's, that's a nice, impressive outcome. And that's what we're looking for to try to optimize this IO transfer, this data movement. So of course you're asking, well, what happens if we can't cache it all in GPU memory? Does it, does the, you know, does it, do we see any improvement at all? And that's where this comes in. So this is like the ETL processing for TPCXBB query five. It's basically the same query uh, that query five does for its ETL. This is the ETL processing to get ready to train a logistical regression model. And that needs to produce, I think, 10 input, 10 input vectors. And that model is going to identify what visitors are interested in on different categories. But that ETL is particularly expensive. And so we can see that just doing the ETL for this, using those 192 cores uh, from those, across the two DGX2 nodes, we see that that query runs in you know, just over 1,550 seconds on the CPUs. We turn again, turn on the plugin without using the shuffle, just using regular Spark legacy shuffle. And that cuts the time to 172 seconds, which is a very nice uh, win. And again, this is shuffling well over 800 gigabytes of compressed data, far more than query 22 did. And so we are spilling not only from the GPU memory to host memory, but we're spilling to disk quite a bit of the data as well. But even with that, we see that turning on this shuffle plugin we dropped the GPU time in half. So we took an already nice win 
from just using the Rapids Accelerator and doubled its performance by adding this shuffle, again, leveraging these high bandwidth transfers over NVLink and over uh, NVLink when we can cache it and RDMA if we have to go through host memory in the worst case. So with that, what are the next steps for this project? So first off, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna open source this accelerator. We're actively in the process of it. That's imminently going to happen. We're also actively working on nested type support, such as arrays, structures, and maps. We're doing decimal types. And of course, we're working on more SQL operators all the time. A little bit further out, we're working on GPU direct storage, as I mentioned before. Time zone support for timestamps. Right now, we only support times, the UTC time zone. We're working on SQL higher order functions and of course UDFs and user-defined functions. And you may be wondering, how can we support UDFs? It's a black box of code. How can we automatically translate to that to put on a GPU? And yes, that is a very, very difficult problem, which is why it's further out. But we do have a research team that's looking into ways of not necessarily translating arbitrary UDFs, but looking at certain kinds of UDFs and being able to digest them, break them down, and translate them automatically into GPU operations so that we can accelerate even some UDFs. So where can you go to get more information? Uh, I highly recommend you go to like main landing page we have for it, which is nvidia.com slash spark. There we'll have all the information about the Rapids Accelerator. Uh, I recommend you use the contact us link there where you can get in touch with NVIDIA's Spark team. Uh, you can listen to Adobe's email marketing uh, use case where they used Databricks and this Accelerator plugin to speed up and accelerate their marketing intelligence services use case pipeline. And finally, there's a free ebook at nvidia.com slash spark dash book that covers the GPU features coming in Spark 3, the Rapid Accelerator plugin, and details like that. And with that, thank you.